Well, a very warm welcome to everybody uh, to our second session of the day, uh, on the day that we're launching the 2013 edition of our Global Prosperity Index. Um, I will just take advantage of my position as chair of this panel to plug the index again. Um, launched today, uh, please also visit prosperity.com uh, to find out more about the Prosperity Index. Um, I should also welcome our global audience who are following along on our live stream. Uh, we encourage those in the room, but also those watching around the world to contribute and to join the conversation on Twitter. Uh, please uh, find us at Legatum Inst. Um, that's Legatum Institute, but just cut down slightly, at Legatum Inst. And the hashtag that we're using uh, to join the conversation is hashtag prosperity. It's uh, a real uh, pleasure to... Uh, chair this, uh, this second panel discussion. Uh, the subject that we're going to be looking at this afternoon is, does technology stimulate entrepreneurship and prosperity? Um, and uh, you'll be pleased to know that that's not simply a yes or no answer. Our panelists um, are here ready with uh, data, with experience, and with um, uh, lots of uh, preparation to, uh, to go into some of the details um, and the uh, nuances of answering that question. Uh, immediately uh, to my left is Erko Orsio, who is the Chair in Technology Venturing and Entrepreneurship and the Director of the Doctoral <coughs> Programme at Imperial College London Business School. Um, Prof Professor Erko uh, is the co-founder of the Global Entrepreneurship and Development Institute and co-author of the Global Entrepreneurship and Development Index. Please join me in welcoming Erko this afternoon. <laughs> To his left is Christian Bush, uh, who is the founder of Sandbox. Sandbox is a leading global network for the most inspiring innovators below 30. Uh, and uh, Christian teaches entrepreneurship at the London School of Economics and acts as associate director at the LSE's uh, Innovation and Co-Creation Lab. So please join me in welcoming Christian. To my far right is Luke Johnson. Luke is uh, the chairman and part owner of, uh, sorry, I should say he's the chairman of the private equity house uh, Risk Capital Partners, through which he is the chairman and part owner of Patisserie Valerie, Bread Limited, uh, and it's the firm behind Gale's Artisan Bakery chain. Um, and Luke, uh, uh, in, a, in a previous life, a former life, I should say, maybe, was the chairman of Channel 4 Television Corporation, um, and he also uh, is the uh, chairman of the newly formed Centre for Entrepreneurs here at the Legatum Institute. Please join me in welcoming Luke. And the gentleman to my immediate right is Iqbal Kadir. Uh, Iqbal is the founder and director of the Legatum Centre for Development and Entrepreneurship at MIT in Boston. Uh, Iqbal founded uh, Grameen Phone, which is um, one of the largest or the largest, largest. the largest mobile phone provider in Bangladesh uh, and is um, uh, widely recognized to be one of the pioneers in uh, the using mobile technology in order to transform low-income countries. Please join me in welcoming Iqbal. And Iqbal, maybe I can start with you, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, the question that we're looking to answer uh, this afternoon is, um, I think, helpfully broad. Um, in, uh, and, but also, I think, um, based on your experience with Grameen Phone uh, in, in Bangladesh, I think you've probably um, got um, masses of, uh, of, of real-life experience of how technology um, can and does stimulate entrepreneurship and prosperity. Um, so I wonder if you might take the floor to start with and just provide some opening remarks around that thing. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nathan. Uh, my simple answer is that technologies uh, are game changers. Mm. And uh, sometimes they are less perceptible than other times. But they are always changing the game. <laughs> and uh, entrepreneurs are the ones who are trying to make a living by changing the game. So they usually take the game-changing force mm. and unleash a new, uh, new force, creating a business, which then 
changes the society. So that's my simple answer. Uh, of course, I, given the discussion in the Prosperity Index as I was listening to the previous panel, I have to put a caveat to that, which is that um, I'm talking about just economic forces. And you, have, you take into account many non-economic things. So I fully acknowledge that the origin, the energy that we drive to get these things done, or the purposes that we pursue are not necessarily economic. But in between, subtracting the original force, let's say, let's say I have the energy to do something, mm. you may have the energy to do something else. If we subtract the origin energy and the purposes we pursue, so for instance, I might try to make money, but I send it to my mother. That's an altruistic thing. So are not necessarily economic. And uh, so, but in between is not a trivial matter. It's a, there's a lot of sorting out how things are done, how things move forward, how things fall, fall behind. But that's my simple answer. But since I'm a professor, I can give a more complicated answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the complicated answer is this. If you look at, look at any technology, let's say how we started writing, maybe somebody used a stick several thousand years ago on clay and started creating alphabet. That increased our, our capabilities. Okay. As Rose was pointing out about the capabilities, well, the writing changed capabilities. Okay. And it, then technologies then changes and evolves. Let's say in the 15th century, Gutenberg developed printing. Of course, before that, there were quills. Many other things evolved. And each time a new technology came, the capabilities changed. So Gutenberg unleashed printing. And that suddenly made books more easily producible. Okay. So many of these things are changing all the time. And then suppose uh, at the time, then somebody came up in the 19th century, a rolling uh, printing. Okay? And that made it possible to print newspapers. Okay? So that also changed again. And another force was unleashed. And then eventually, let's say recently, internet has come about. So now we are publishing in the web. So another force of printing and writing going on. So what I'm saying is each of these waves gives rise to a new forces which entrepreneurs can grab and take on. But also, technology gives rise to radical turns completely. So for example, whoever genius invented the alphabet, he never imagined that this would give rise to alphabetization. But some new guy came along and he said, you know, now that B always comes after A, C always comes after B, I can use that and create a new force. And that's what, uh, let's say, telephone books came about, or dictionaries came about. So, and that's also recombined, because uh, printing and alphabetization combined to produce a dictionary, or a telephone book, etc. So what I'm getting at is that all these changes are always taking place. Each time there is a change, new set of entrepreneurs are unleashed. Mm -hmm. okay? And of course, at the same time, the changes are coming not necessarily from inside, but from outside. Because those who are in the game don't want to change. They are comfortable with the game going on. So usually outsiders trying to get in mm. are the innovators and changing them. Mm. So this is why, in general, it's unleashing those changes. And every time new capabilities are created, the economy is expanded. But that's only one way to look at it. But there are two, three other things I want to mention. And before I end, the, the second point is that as each time somebody is, it's, remember, when I'm producing a tool, let's say I produce a tool, and it could empower another person, then that person's energy can be multiplied and create more economic value. So I take a wheelbarrow, and instead of carrying five pieces of brick, I take 20 pieces of brick. So it extends my abilities. Now, there, then a lot of people would take that and probably um, carry more bricks or more stones, whatever. But then they can buy my wheelbarrow, the provider of the tool, then I can be in the business of selling wheelbarrows. Okay? So what I'm saying is they don't necessarily have to have an initial capability to buy my wheelbarrows, but rather they can earn it through the use of the tool. So it creates a link between citizens and entrepreneurs because he, they, they both can move up in tandem. That's one reason it creates a greater uh, technology unleashes entrepreneurship. Mm. Because you could do it even in countries that don't have the purchasing power. But the, another problem in general, in life in, at large, 
is there is always a David and Goliath issue. So let's say somebody is big and powerful. He's the incumbent doing certain things. And somebody wants to get in, like I said, right? Mm. And this is usually a problem. Let's say in a poor country, maybe the state is very powerful. It wouldn't let anything happen. Or the vested interest, few powerful families are ruling that country. Well, you need to bring a new force in it. So David usually will lose against the Goliath unless David has an advantage. Okay. Now, technology usually gives an advantage because he has figured out something new mm. that others have not. Okay. So the Goliath may not know that what to do with the new technology, okay. but David has figured it out. So while David plays this, then maybe it, uh, you know, by the time, uh, you know, the Goliath doesn't even notice it. And then it has flourishes, and then it's too, too uh, late to stop. Can you give us a couple of examples? Um, yeah, take the cell phone as an example. Uh, most fixed networks tried to, didn't understand that it would be very, very transformative. Mm. Okay? So they let it go, so they said, oh, it's a bunch of yuppies will take these phones, and you'll be okay, it's no big deal. But it became a big deal later on. And it's always like that. If you look at uh, Google, may not have come about if Microsoft fully understood it initially. Okay. So what I'm saying is this is the nature of the game, mm. that you, we always celebrate knowledge, but ignorance plays a very important role in the world. <laughs> because what happens is the powerful is more contained by its ignorance. Okay? So be that as it may, the next force that goes through this is the dispersion of power. Because every time I'm inventing something or I'm reorganizing society in some ways, in an entrepreneurial effort, I'm necessarily creating something new. Otherwise, nobody would take it because they would go with the old. So because the, it, it creates a dispersion of power, and that overall improves governance and overall improves the, the, the ground in which uh, new things can flourish. Mm. So whenever, uh, so for example, this is why aid and other things didn't work in poor countries, because they centralized power. Communism centralized power. But what we need is dispersion of power, and that happens through innovations. And as you can say, of course, the center might stop the innovation, but usually, thank God, they don't always see it. Mm. And that's why it does flourish, and it goes on. So the bottom line is, uh, hold on, I just summarized a little bit. I, I'll make it very quick. So my point is, there is a win-win link, one, no, point number one, between an entrepreneur and a technology that the technology provides, between citizens and entrepreneurs. Mm. And the second is, as people become more, has a greater purchasing power, let's say cell phones gave rise to greater purchasing power, then entrepreneurs selling soaps and toothpaste who have nothing to do with cell phones have greater amount of money uh, because the consumers have greater purchasing power so they can sell to them. So new kinds of entrepreneurship come about. And the third thing is it gives rise to unleashing of new possibilities and dispersion of power. And that gives rise to uh, more better governance and through which yet new innovations can emerge easily. Mm. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Lots there. I think we'll probably come back to a lot of that um, <laughs> during questions. I'm particularly interested in the idea of game changers sure. um, and some examples there. But um, before we go into that, um, Chris, I wonder if I can turn to you and ask um, you to either comment on that or, or provide some, some opening remarks yourself or a mixture of the two. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. And um, yeah, I have two major kind of themes, thoughts on, on, on the issue, which partly build on, on what uh, Imran just said. Um, the first one is around technology as a kind of catalyzer for ideas, for capabilities, mm -hmm. for um, everything that somehow functions as a fulfiller for needs for, for, for human beings. And the other one is more around how do we create new governance models around that? How, do, how, how does technology allow for more accountability, transparency, and so on? Um, so on the first track, um, it's a bit more kind of Western bias, motivated by the work at, at Sandbox, um, where we help young innovators. And when we observed them over the last six years, some of the patterns we saw there was that a lot of the models they face nowadays are kind of the traditional models, traditional organizations, either mm -hmm. for-profit, not-for-profit, who are still very linear, like you either um, follow kind of the 
for-profit model, which is about making money, um, career development, personal development, less so about meaning, or the other way, which is more about meaning, but less so about personal development, career development. And the problem with these models and with technology around that, with organizations around it, is it is based on this very old idea of Maslow, right? It's very linear of you first fulfill material needs, then you fulfill emotional needs, then if you still have time, you self-actualize yourself someday. Mm -hmm. Um, so Bill Gates first builds up Microsoft, then a foundation. You yes. first do well, then do good, and others do it the other way around. But usually you do it in a relatively linear fashion. What we saw with these innovators, though, is they want to do these things at the same time mm. in a lot of contexts around the world. They want to have meaning in what they're doing while at the same time making a lot of money with it. And I think um, the interesting thing what, what follows from that is if we understand that there are kind of shifts that come in terms of generations, not as, as age groups, not as the 20 to 30-year-old Generation Y, but something we, we, we labeled Generation Y question mark, so W-H-I question mark, um, which is more about a mindset, the mindset mm -hmm. of people who question things and want to build on. And if you, if, you, if you take these kind of new mindsets that are emerging and say technology ideally now is a catalyzer for ideas around this, for the needs that evolve from that and so on, then we want to somehow understand what are not only solutions, so what is not the next app and what is not the next type of, what Igber said, like the first stage of evolution, which is about solving a direct problem, but how do we build platforms? How do we build, um, the, the simple example in the tech world would maybe be the app store of, 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 of Apple, but if you go into the developing world, you, you look at platforms, I mean, Grameen is a, is a, is a great example of platform building, mm -hmm. um, or, or our labs, an, an example we worked with, which is about how do you use technology in a way that it enables others to build on that technology and to by this enhance their capabilities. And I think um, if, if we later have more time, I'll go more into detail, but one of the organizations I was really fascinated um, at the base of the pyramid, so low income context, is our labs um, in South Africa, which mm -hmm. is um, basically training former drug addicts, very vulnerable people um, in social media uh -huh. and how they can use their mobile phones they anyways have to advise each other. So to become less dependent on government services, oh, wow. which they anyways don't trust, but to help each other via SMS, text, and, and so on services. And this idea spread to 18 different locations around the world, even into developed countries. Not because it was a fancy technology, but because it was embedded in the local context and because people understood what the values of people are, what people really drives. The drive of people was not necessarily to only survive, but also to help each other. Once they learned how it, was, how it, how it works, they were proud to show others how it works. Mm. So again, it comes to the Maslow idea, it's not about only somehow surviving. It's about how do you understand that people have pride, that people have, have dignity and so on, so real cap uh, functionings of, of people. And so on the second dimension, what I find um, really interesting is the whole I dimension that when we look at technology, as an example, social media. When we look at the Middle East was, a, was, was one of the examples where um, accountability was completely redefined in terms of it was not only visible much better what governments do, but also the actions towards how you could react to it were much broader and much more effective. And when you kind of transfer this to organizations, to networked type of, 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 of organizations, where you are more and more in kind of collaborative spaces, mm -hmm. knowledge economy, where you have to somehow give back and forth, coming back to the idea of, of circles of needs where my circle of need depends on the circle of needs of others. So it is in my enlightened self-interest to be not too self-interested in whatever I do. So I developed this idea that, well, you, you have this kind of accountability towards each other, which comes away from the old hierarchical models of organizations where you say, well, look, um, you use technology to somehow control. You have a camera there, and the camera tells you which employees work and which ones don't. You come to co-tweet services where people peer-to-peer -peer control each other and where you see within project teams, I'm much more accountable to my colleague than I'm about uh, to be to my, to, my, to, my, um, to, my, to my boss. So the point being that it allows lateral accountability. Yeah. It allows yeah. accountability peer to peer. And I think this is one of the biggest shifts, which I think a lot of people, I don't understand how, how this is not visible yet, that the digital footprints we, we, we kind of leave, not, not only with the NSA and others, but, but also on Google, on kind of all the activities we're doing are somehow more and more portrayed. Mm. So the key point becomes, again, it is in my enlightened self-interest to not be too self-interested. As a last thought, as a, as a German, I obviously have to bring in a certain philosophical angle as well, <laughs> um, which, which is that um, one, one of my landsmen, who was much more brilliant and, and intelligent, Goethe, um, he basically said that if you take man as he is, you make him worse. But if you take man as what he should be, you make him capable of becoming what he could be. 
And I think if you transfer this to technology, that you say, ideally, if we normatively look at technology, what we want to create is platforms that enable people to enhance their capabilities towards the way that these source pr prosperity versus that leads into destruction and, and, and so on. So I think that's kind of some of the thoughts, and I guess a lot of that uh, will later come up. Great. Well, thank you. Um, uh, particularly interested in the idea that um, young entrepreneurs want to make money, change the world, self-actualize, all at the same time. I think I'd like to kind of come back to that and, and, and in later conversation, if possible. I wonder if I can turn to Luke now, from my far right. Luke, um, firstly, any, um, any response to, to any of that? But um, secondly, um, how do you kind of see the role of technology in stimulating entrepreneurship and, and prosperity? Well, obviously, throughout history, I think uh, entrepreneurs have invented technology and that uh, stimulated economic activity and um, led to, you know, in rising prosperity. Mm. Um, I happen to think that probably uh, the internet, which has been the most important sort of technological leap, certainly in the last couple of decades, uh, we're still in the foothills uh, because it seems to me that if all the world's knowledge ever accumulated is now available everywhere simultaneously to everyone, then the compounding effect of that has surely not really been felt. And so it does seem to me that as more of the world gets connected, as more of the world's knowledge is uploaded, I think I read recently that something like 90% of the world's data has only been amassed in the last few years. And so as the benefits of that accumulation of knowledge flow through, it seems to me that the technological advances that are likely to happen in the coming years are going to be very considerable. And one area that I've become involved with relatively recently is in um, discoveries to try and defeat cancer. You know, the advances being made there, particularly in connection with genomics and so forth, are accelerating, there's no question. Um, and so I think the opportunities for entrepreneurs and the benefits to mankind of all those entrepreneurs working together, using that knowledge to their advantage and to society's advantage, are um, yet to be felt. And I also think that um, recent advances in technology have made it quicker and easier to start a business, easier to experiment, quicker to fail if it doesn't work and try something else. Mm. Uh, when I first started as an entrepreneur in 1980, it certainly felt as if it cost more to try things out. It took longer to discover if they worked. Mm. So failure was more painful. I actually think culturally, certainly in this country, but I believe in many others, entrepreneurship is being uh, more widely embraced. And I think that is also connected with this idea that you can fail quickly and cheaply now. Mm. Um, and I think the fact that there is a real uh, generational difference between people who are, let's say, in their 20s and younger, uh, who have grown up absolutely with the internet, and therefore, you know, to them it's like breathing. And uh, I think the um, ability for, for them to maximize its advantages is, again, yet to be felt. Uh, the fact that in this country, for example, since 2008, I've read recently that twice as many young people are uh, it's almost 10% now participating in a, a startup of some kind or other. Shows there is this enormous shift going on, which uh, I think can only be good news. And I think a great many, many of them are, even if they're not running a technological business, they're taking advantage of technology to freelance or start mm -hmm. something. Um, and so I think I feel exceptionally optimistic. I think in a way we've had, certainly in the West, five years of, of uh, stalling, but we are in the coming years starting to feel, you know, the real super benefits of all these advantages and, and advances. Uh, so I'm feeling very positive. Mm. Um, I wonder if I might just ask a follow-up question. Um, the Centre for Entrepreneurs that just newly started here at the Institute um, has as its main objective to raise the profile of entrepreneurs, to support, to encourage, to um, uh, kind of put forward the, the case for entrepreneurs, um, particularly in the UK. Um, from your own perspective, how do you feel entrepreneurs are viewed um, in, in the West, maybe generally, but in the UK, um, and what can 
we, you specifically with the Centre for Entrepreneurs, do about that? Well, I think what we want to do at the Centre for Entrepreneurs is two things in particular. I think we want to uh, educate uh, journalists, the media, uh, politicians, mm. opinion formers as to the economic and social importance of entrepreneurs in any society in terms of job creation, in terms of innovation, in terms of you know, advancement of human prosperity. Uh, and I think the, you know, people need to learn that they are the prime movers in progress. Uh, and I think that's part of our task. I think the other task is to research why entrepreneurship happens, how we can encourage more of it, uh, what makes entrepreneurs particularly successful, uh, and so forth. And so I think there are two key strands. And what I would say is that the UK has dramatically changed in terms of the uh, assessment of entrepreneurs mm. and um, how they are, are rated in general. But I think there's further work to do, mm. because I think historically, um, you know, certain people in the, in the public service are always seen as the most... Uh, admirable figures in society, but actually, who is more important than those who create the jobs? Mm. I think no one is more important than those who create the jobs, and that's what entrepreneurs do. And so I think it comes down to that very often, because through many countries, particularly in the EU, for example, there are very high levels of youth unemployment. There is no bigger problem. Uh, Gallup reports in their annual survey that the single most important thing for people everywhere in the world is to get a good job. And the solution to that is more entrepreneurship. Thank you very much. Um, finally, uh, Erko, uh, lots has been said already. Um, I wonder if you uh, might want to respond to anything that's already been said, but also um, from your own perspective, um, just in terms of the role of, um, of uh, technology in stimulating uh, prosperity. And I know that particularly in your own background, um, uh, you, uh, you are one of the founders of an index which tried to actually measure and capture um, this, the entrepreneurship. So I wonder if you might speak to that a little bit. Yeah, um, OK, where to start? It, it's been excellent comments throughout. Maybe I'll um, start from my own background. So mm. um, I'm in an innovation and entrepreneurship group at the um, Imperial College Business School. So our focus is on innovation and entrepreneurship. And then the question is, well, these two words, innovation and entrepreneurship, tend to be used uh, interchangeably. And, and quite often, people take them to mean pretty much the same thing, broadly speaking. Um, my own background, and interestingly enough, so roughly half of the people in our group are primarily entrepreneurship people, and the other half are innovation people. And we have exactly two different opinions in how that group should be called. And I'm of the opinion that it should be called entrepreneurship and innovation group rather than innovation and entrepreneurship. <laughs> um, Who's winning that argument at the moment? <laughs> well, we are working on it. Uh, uh, but it's actually these two things have a very interesting relationship because they are not the same thing. Mm. Uh, Schumpeter, who um, was the great intellectual light um, that inspired much of the thinking on entrepreneurship and innovation himself, changed his mind somewhere halfway through this career. He, he began as an entrepreneurship person, emphasizing the role of entrepreneurship in economic development he spoke about. Um, the gales of creative destruction that entrepreneurs unleash in economies and force the uh, established industry incumbents to renew their ways and, and keep them honest and, and, and forcing some of the more obsolete practices out from the industry. And then he changed his mind with the growth of the corporation roughly mid-1930s, 1940s. And, and then he was all about big large companies and, and R&D as, uh, as the main source of economic dynamism and growth. Um, in our own research, um, we have been working, as you, as you mentioned, we have a Global Entrepreneurship and Development Index. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I've been working for 15, 16 years now on, on Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which seeks to measure entrepreneurship in countries. And it does so. And, and this year, we are sampling 80 countries 
conducting at least 2,000 interviews per country. So we are taking these adult population samples and asking people, well, are you trying to start new businesses? What are your attitudes? Do you think uh, entrepreneurs are respected in your country? Would fear of failure prevent you from starting new firms and so on and so forth? Very, very fascinating. We started with 10 countries. And, um, and, and these were G7, Finland, where I'm from originally, and, and two others, um, developed high-income countries. And as, as you would expect, the US came as, as top of the list. And we thought that, good, well, you know, more entrepreneurship is always better for economic development. Then we started adding countries. We added Australia and New Zealand. And all of a sudden, New Zealand was on top in terms of well, how many people are trying to start new firms in the country. Then we added Mexico. And, and holy moly, Mexico went on top. <laughs> and, and then we added Uganda, and Uganda broke all records. And, and currently, the, um, the world record holder in terms of uh, self-employment, uh, the prevalence of self-employment activity within the population, how many people are running their own businesses or trying to start their own businesses, is Zambia. Well, clearly, Zambia as a country has many things going for it, but probably Zambia wouldn't try top in an innovation ranking. So this, again, emphasizes that these are two very different things. Um, so what should one say? Um, there are a couple of lessons, and one, one that we have learned from that, from that study, and it's a fascinating and ongoing study, is that more entrepreneurship is not always better. There's a question of quality and quantity. Hmm. And, and that's very important to recognize. So what you need to do in entrepreneurship policy is emphasize quality. Trying to get all the people to start new firms is, is not good for the economy because you end up allocating resources to less productive uses. You have people who might, should be doing other things, starting new firms. Um, the second thing is that when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship, it's a very interesting um, relationship, and this then speaks to technology. You need both. Um, there's a big literature focusing on innovation in countries uh, called National Systems of Innovation. And, and, and this was a very popular framework guiding policy uh, analysis and implementation in, in many countries, especially in the 1990s, was the heyday of National Systems of Innovation. <coughs> if you take any of the foundational writings of that literature and try to find the word entrepreneurship, it doesn't exist in there. Why? Because they all built on the later Schumpeter, to whom innovation and R&D was everything, but entrepreneurship was nothing. Um, what our research tends to suggest is that you need both. And, and you need to find a way to work the entrepreneurs into this broader innovation system context. If you only invest in innovation, you'll end up in investing in industry incumbents, and what you get as a result is incremental innovation. If you want radic radical trajectory altering innovation, then you have to invest in entrepreneurship. So there's this symbiosis that people are only recently have become aware of, and, and mm. somehow, when you think about policy issues, you need to balance the two. And I suppose I'll leave it at that, mm. and then I have a couple of examples. Later. Okay. Um, well, thank you, um, gentlemen. I want to come back to, um, before we open up for questions, I want to come back to one of the points that was made um, earlier um, by Luke and, and um, ask Iqbal um, his take on this. Um, Luke, you mentioned that you, um, in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation, um, we're really in the sort of the early stage, I think the foothills was the word you used, of, of um, making use of the internet and kind of using it to its full capacity. Um, and I wonder, um, Iqbal, if you might speak to that from a developing country's perspective and how, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about how the internet um, uh, has changed um, entrepreneurship in developed countries, and yeah. Luke specifically mentioned how it, at least it appears the cost of starting a business is now, of failing in a, in a business, is lower. Yeah. Um, but what impact does the internet have on, on entrepreneurship sure. in developing sure. countries? Yeah, okay. Um, but let me also relate to another point that Luke yeah. made uh, about when the cell, you know, uh, and innovations again happen in sophisticated laboratories, 
Uh, but it can also happen among normal people, just without a serious scientific understanding. So I'll give you an example. Let's say when the cell phone came about, and you made the point that these ITs can give rise to other kinds of entrepreneurship in other sectors. And I'll give you an example. Um, there was a barber in, in Dhaka where, and I do talk to barbers, you know, people <laughs> might think I don't. But my point is, uh, there's a barber who lost his uh, storefront uh, lease, you know, the street front store. It was too expensive. But now that he had a f um, phone, he simply bought a bicycle and called his uh, clients and gave, a, gave them haircuts at their homes. And every two weeks or three weeks, he would call them and say, oh, you know, I was here uh, three weeks ago. Can I give you another haircut? And so he didn't need the lease anymore. Okay. At the same time, the customer got better service because they didn't have to go out. They got it at home. So everybody won. So here is a little innovation that took place uh, and made it made the more economic sense for everyone. Okay. That took place simply because the tool was available. So I, I just want to keep that point in our mind, mm. that human minds get unleashed in many ways if it is out there. It, it improves our vocabulary of thinking in general uh, if we have tools out there. Mm. But on the internet issue, actually, if you, there is a good news and bad news in my mind. <laughs> One good news is that cell phones, for instance, are after all computers. And they're actually connected computers, very powerful computers. Okay. And in fact, uh, let's say when the internet started booming in the United States, uh, at that time, computer, desktop computer was probably less powerful than many cell phones today. Mm. Okay. So when the internet came about, um, then there was a lot of innovations happening on the internet. And as you say, we are still at the foothill after 20 years. Now, the point is, how come we don't have similar kinds of innovations at the same level going on in, in large countries like India, or where there is a lot of IT expertise, but, and there is a billion such computers. Okay? So one would expect a new eBay, new this and that, all sorts of things would come about. The, the bad news is that the cell phones are centrally controlled, unlike the internet. Okay? So internet, there was nobody controlling at the center. And the, the cell phones are actually controlled by the cell phone company in the center. As a result, this kind of innovations don't happen as much. So I think there is a role of the government in this case mm -hmm. to show that the cell phone companies should act like a utility and provide the pipes, but not necessarily run the cars. Okay. Namely, they can provide the highways. But other entrepreneurs can get into the business of providing bus service, van service, a taxi service, all sorts of other things where the cell phone companies simply provide the roads. Okay? And they get paid for it. Okay? So that kind of intervention, I think, is necessary. Um, so, that's, that's, uh, so what I'm saying is, yes, the internet will spread. But I think it will spread through the cell phone. But certain things are holding it back. And it should be unleashed. Mm. Mm. OK, thank you. Um, I think we could probably continue talking among ourselves for the rest of the session, but I wonder if we could open it up to the panel. There are roaming microphones going round. Um, if you do have a question, please do state who you are, where you're from, um, and then your question clearly and concisely. Yeah, the gentleman at the back. Um, there was a point raised in the first session about small, com uh, small countries versus big countries. Is it easier to be innovative, and I get your point about the difference between innovation and entrepreneurship, in a smaller environment? Um, a lot of people say that it's easy to be innovative in a small company compared to a big company. And so does this lead to, pros um, to, to a correlation in, in prosperity across certain countries maximizing an advantage of, of an innovation over, uh, say, other countries? Um, so uh, is it easier to be innovative and entrepreneurial in a small company, country? Any takers for that one? If nobody yes. takes it, then I'll take it. Um, I think that is going to jump in. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, in the um, Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Survey, we have been looking for the first 10 years, we only looked at the creation of new firms. And we found big differences. By the way, Zambia, in terms of self-employment rate, um, is about 10 times, uh, close to 10 times as entrepreneurial as the UK. 
by that measure. The reason for that, of course, is that the Zambian economy is unable to create high quality jobs, so people end up perhaps selling baskets in street corners, which is not necessarily productive entrepreneurship. But we measured this entrepreneurship creation of new firms, and then a couple of years ago we added a measure of intrapreneurship, which is doing something entrepreneurial um, on behalf of your employer. And the really interesting thing happens when you combine the two, and I'm, I'm talking about high-income countries now because uh, low-income countries are so different from high-income countries. And these differences across countries tend to balance out. So it seems that you have a certain fairly constant amount of entrepreneurial effort in high-income countries, but the form that that effort takes can vary dramatically. In Japan, it's all about entrepreneurship, and there's fairly little self-employment or new firm creation activity, whereas in the US, it's the opposite. Now, what the consequence of that is that you will have different types of innovation coming out from those two contexts. Mm -hmm. Rad uh, typically, the more radical innovation would come out from the US, um, and, and the more incremental, uh, path-dependent innovation would come from Japan, where you know they are great at manufacturing things. Um, small countries, pretty much the same thing. Um, um, as small countries more innovative, well, Scandinavian countries, and this goes back to the notion that you know being small and homogeneous helps in 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 many different domains, and also probably so in innovation. Um, Luke, I wonder if I might call on you next um, uh, to respond to the point on um, whether it's easier to be uh, entrepreneurial in uh, within a small company or kind of within a small country. And I wonder if you have any um, kind of real life uh, examples. Well, I certainly think it's easier to be entrepreneurial in a new company. Mm -hmm. uh, I think longer established businesses become institutionalized mm -hmm. and they tend to, towards bureaucracy as they grow. And both of those inhibit entrepreneurship. And um, I don't, I mean, this has absolutely been my experience in my career, uh, but I also believe it to be true. Uh, you know, I think in new small businesses, there aren't rules. There isn't established practice, and uh, it's almost inevitable you, that you will do the pivoting thing of changing your business model, sometimes very radically. Uh, and failure is a constant threat, so therefore thre failure isn't such a high, um, isn't so scary, because you live with it on a weekly basis. Can we make the payroll? Mm -hmm. Whereas in big organisations, the rewards for for uh, taking a risk aren't worth it to a very large degree. Uh, risk is more painful than the gains of, of, of success. So um, uh, people don't take risks, and if they do, they are desperately unwilling to admit a mistake. Um, and therefore, they carry on far longer than they should. It becomes much more expensive, and they dig themselves much deeper in a hole. Um, and. You know, I've had the experience constantly where in a tiny organization, two, two or three of you meet in a room and you say, well, this project isn't work it, working, let's can it this morning. If you're in a large organization, it can take two years to have that conversation. It's a lot more expensive. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, any more questions from the floor, please? Yes, front row. Um, Could you just sorry. wait for the microphone oh, just for one second? It's for the benefit of uh, those watching on the live stream. Hello, my name's Joanne Holland. Um, <coughs> Innovation and entrepreneurs need access to money, and um, it can come from possibly the government, but also private investors. Mm. And um, I'd just like to ask the panel what they think about it, because clearly the access to money has been restricted, certainly in the UK. And when investors do go in, they're often diluted on second and third round funding. So what, um, what view do you have on access to money, funding, role of government, Mm. role of banks. I'm going to come to Iqbal with that one in terms of the uh, experiences in uh, developing countries. Before that, Christian, do you have any, you work with a lot of innovators, entrepreneurs, young, particularly uh, young innovators. Um, what's been your experience or what's been their experience um, of having access to finance in order to actually get their ideas off the ground? Mm. It's interesting because I felt 
Um, and maybe very briefly, the last mm. thought on, on, the, on the question before, which I found really interesting in terms of when you look at entrepreneurs versus entrepreneurs, and particularly um, because I had a very similar, when looking at all these young kids who try to go into big corporates and then somehow run into the, uh, the, towards the big walls and then somehow at some point start their own enterprises. But I felt that um, there's a lot of people who, um, for whom it's easier to make an idea happen as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. But the scale at which you make it happen a lot of times within the corporation, once you went through the politics, once you went through getting the, the buy-in of the, the, the champion of the CEO and so on, so is potentially quite high. Because so of the support because structure, of the support structure and the resources at hand. Mm. So I feel that, that kind of there, there's probably like something to both in terms of how you, how you can innovate within big organizations if you have the right kind of culture, the right spirit, the right people. And then on the other hand side on, on this. But I feel um, it, with regard to this one, we had a very interesting discussion earlier. And I think uh, Echo has, has a lot more experience in the whole institutional um, um, question of this. But um, one of the points I was quite interested in, um, so we've been working with some of the governments around the world around the question, how do you actually um, create these entrepreneurial ecosystems? And I think a lot of them make the, I'm not sure if it's a mistake, but kind of it's this, this, intent, like this intent that you somehow you provide capital. Um, and you provide somehow a, a good school and then you hope that it happens. Mm -hmm. um, versus that a lot of the things that we saw at these parts of the world where it worked were that there were kind of institutional complementarities in the sense that capital was followed by a certain idea of having the right mentors, was followed by a certain idea of having the right educational system. So if you look at Germany, for example, in Germany, we're not kind of known as the, the radical innovators. Um, but we're relatively well known for process innovation mm. for, the, for, the, for, the, for the easy reason that we have a structure where you have an apprentice system um, where you say people get into this whole engineering idea when they are 16, 17. Um, then you have employers who are open to people who study while they work. So you have a kind of idea of the culture that is open to it. Um, and then you have funders who say, well, we invest into people to the degree that we understand that these solutions will uh, take time. Um, so I think um, in that terms, I always find it quite easy um, <coughs> when those entrepreneurs I feel who I met who lamented about money, um, usually were the ones where anyways had the feeling that they would not necessarily make the idea happen. Because I felt a lot of times that um, resource constraints, when you go to a developing country, when you go to Kenya, um, when you look at the amount of business model innovation, the amount of innovation that happens in Kenya without any capital at hand, I mean, they use bricolage. They say, well, OK, I don't, have the ca I, I don't have the capital here, but I have two great people here who somehow have a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. I have, a, I, I have a, a brother who somehow owns a factory. And now I make the best out of it. So mm -hmm. while I think that it's important that there are the right capital kind of incentives and the right structures of setting it up, I think it's much more important to have the right role models <coughs> that say, look, I made it without having money at the beginning. I, I made it without having kind of all these resources at hand mm. because I think then it becomes really interesting. Mm. Because one of the things, as a last thought on this, um, which I would actually be quite afraid of, which is the other side of the coin, if people have too much money at the beginning. I mean, I've seen it where, where people then get kind of like into this mood of, well, okay, now we, we first focus on getting a nice office, then we focus on getting a nice whatever it is, um, but then completely forget about what they actually mm. were about to innovate. So, I'm, I'm, I'm a very strong believer that government should focus on providing the right incentives, but also making very clear that there needs to be a certain idea of, of, of bricolage where you get to a certain point where you prove that you could make it without. Mm. Okay. okay, do you want to comment on that? Well, yeah, this, the role of government <coughs> in innovation and entrepreneurship is interesting. Um, um, probably the deepest peacetime recession um, experienced by country that wasn't in a war or going through ma major civil conflict or something like that before Greece was Finland in early 1990s, 1990 to 1993, uh, because this was triggered by the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, which basically took away one third of Finnish um, uh, foreign trade overnight. So it was a pretty deep recession, minus 16% in GDP in one year. Uh, what happened during the period was that not only did the government keep funding for R&D constant, it increased it to 2.7% of GDP during that period, which was pretty difficult. Um, one of the outcomes of that investment was Nokia Corporation. Now, Nokia was already in existence, obviously, 
but the um, GSM uh, technologies underlying the GSM standard were, were developed during that period, uh, which then became the foundation for Nokia's growth in, in the mobile telephony business. Now, of course, we know that Nokia mobile telephones will be called Microsoft Windows telephones. And, uh, um, so the role of government in innovation is crucial. Um, and, and one of the more controversial findings from our research is a positive correlation between the size of the government and innovative output in a country. And it also applies to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's been a lot of government funding to entrepreneurship in Finland over the years, uh, mainly channeled through the National Technology Agency, TECAS. Two outcomes of this, and, and probably you heard, um, already know about this. Um, one company, gaming company, started in 2010. Um, one of the first participants in the Finnish National Accelerator uh, program just sold 51% of their stock to SoftBank for $1.5 billion, uh, which implies a market valuation of $3 billion for a business that didn't exist three years ago. Another gaming business, Rovio, and this is the Angry Birds. Uh, again, similar story. A lot of government subsidy to that business. These two businesses together, which didn't exist in 2009, are today more valuable than was Nokia's mobile phone business when it was sold to Microsoft. So it's pretty extraordinary what you can achieve if you are consistent in government policy. But you also, when it comes to entrepreneurship, you also have to be highly selective and highly exclusive, which is very difficult uh, policy balance to strike because we are talking about tax funding there and you know mm. when you are distributing tax redistributing tax money then you should be the thinking is that you should be egalitarian but if you want results in entrepreneurship then you have to be highly selective mm. um, and obviously venture funding also matters and uh, private sector funding also matters so perhaps there's something in the Scandinavian model that may or may not trans transfer easily to other contexts. Mm. Speaking of other contexts, um, when we talk about access to finance in the developing world, mm. I'm interested to pick up on the point that Christian made about how um, networks and sort of sure. uh, making do with the best situation you, you, you face yourself, uh, yeah. you find yourself in, um, versus you know, the, the need to uh, actually have formal institutions that provide finance, whether that's from the government or whether right. that's privately funded. Well, we often celebrate uh, the presence of capital as a necessary ingredient for entrepreneurial or success stories. But is, at least let me provide a counterpoint. I'm not saying you don't need capital. Of course you need capital. But it's not quite as simple as that. And to start with Joseph Schumpeter, the professor mentioned, he said in his main book on entrepreneurship, the entrepreneurs provide will and action. That's the main thing they provide. They are not inventors. They are not managers. They are not investors. They bring those things together to assemble a forces that creates a new thing. Okay. So entrepreneurs provide will and action. I'm quoting from his 1911 book. Now, the point I want to make is that I myself, uh, I did not invent cell phones, nothing. But I am sometimes credited to bring, let's say, mobile phones to poor countries or Bangladesh in particular. I didn't, uh, what I really innovated was a new way of distribution. But what I did do that is not because I didn't have capital. Be, uh, but the shortage of capital is not celebrated enough. So what I'm saying is, if, I say, if somebody said, oh, bring telephony to every village in Bangladesh, and I would say, oh, so many telephone booths, it'll cost $3 billion. The World Bank, give me the money. I'll put up all the telephone booths. I would not have innovated how to distribute. So the point is, if you have shortage of capital, your brain waves go in a different way, and that brain waves gives rise to innovations. Hmm. Okay. So what what Gutenberg tried to do is, how do I reduce the cost of production of books? Okay. So the point is that is the main force of innovation, and I I should also point out the rise of the parliament in in the UK in England and the decline of the parliaments in Spain, which actually invented parliament before, was that UK, the king needed money. 
king it had a shortage of capital so the shortage of capital has been very very useful to england and then some, because he needed money he went to businesses he went to people and tried to tax them and that created a link and that's how capitalism and eventually democracy arose here so what i'm trying to say we need to begin to celebrate the how does shortage of capital give rise to good things because that's what brain waves gets going and poor countries as we know the most important resource are the people and the brain power and that's not being capitalized because we think capital is more important and what the rich countries can provide frankly it is okay it's it's one of the ingredients mm -hmm. but it is by no means the most critical ingredient uh, I wonder before we take another question um, Luke if you might be able to respond to that point but um, also a point that Christian made earlier um, on role models uh, and how um, uh, role models uh, of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs uh, uh, are portrayed particularly in the media I know that um, I think you've done some polling recently with regards to the UK about the effect of programs like The Apprentice for example and how that affects um, perceptions about entrepreneurs yes there was a bit of research just published by the Kaufman Foundation in America, which was headlined, Is Entrepreneurship Contagious? And it's all about the idea that people become entrepreneurs because they see someone else working for themselves, being successful in business, uh, and particularly in their immediate surroundings. Mm. And I think it's incredibly important in terms of fostering entrepreneurship in a society to have uh, you know, a member of your family or some immediately connected person who um, is independent and enjoys the freedom of uh, uh, entrepreneurship and, and the idea of controlling their own destiny and taking a risk. Um, so I think role models are actually far more important than, for example, the idea of formally teaching entrepreneurship, mm. which I think is quite difficult. Uh, and I think it doesn't just apply in the immediate home surroundings, if you like, but it also applies in society as a whole. There have been a whole space of programs in recent years that are frankly more entertainment than education, uh, such as um, you know, Dragon's Den and The Apprentice. Net, they are still a force for good because they are still entrepreneurs in the mass media uh, and they are still raising the profile of entrepreneurship as a whole. I think it's a shame they trivialise it a lot, but I guess that gets bigger audiences and so you can't really blame the broadcasters. The fact of the matter is, overall, the attitude towards entrepreneurs has, has improved and changed for the good. Uh, and, you know, I think more and more countries around the world are celebrating entrepreneurship. And that must be a positive thing. Mm. So just um, a point of clarification. So you and your fellow entrepreneurs don't spend your day sat in dimly lit rooms with piles of cash on a table in front of you <laughs> interviewing would be... Well, sometimes we do. <laughs> <laughs> no. Excellent. Um, any more questions from the floor, please? Uh, Gentlemen, right at the back. Uh, please do wait for the microphone to cut. Oh, you have it. You have one. <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Joseph Obunna. Um, I'm interested in the link between um, well-being, technology, and uh, resilience. Um, do you think that um, technology and easy access to, um, to e easy access to information and um, uh, resources depletes resilience in society? Great. I wonder if we might take a second question as well and put two together. Are there any more? Uh, yes, lady just there. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Brock. I'm wondering, it, it all sounds great that we're going to innovate, but where are these ideas going to come from? Uh, because it seems to me if everybody is sitting in front of a computer all day uh, without interacting with fellow human beings, there is just a limited scope for how to come up with new ideas. Mm. Um, perhaps that's, a, that's an argument for how um, technological advancements might actually uh, diminish levels of innovation. I wonder if anybody might take that. Or the first question, which was on the relationship between well-being and, and resilience in terms of entrepreneurship. Any takers? Christian, why don't you start us off? Well, maybe, maybe starting with the second question, which I find quite interesting. So where do ideas come from? Where do good ideas come from? Mm. Um, and particularly, is the kind of... I guess you refer a bit to the online, like tech, social media, so that you kind of spend more time online than in real life and, and so on. And I think um, it comes back to, to the points um, we discussed a bit earlier, that if technology is a tool for us, 
then ideally as a tool it complements what we anyways do offline. So if you look at um, successful communities, for example, let's say if you look at innovation communities, mm. look at innovation communities, I mean, um, Sandbox is one, uh, look at TED, look at other organizations that try to foster kind of this idea that you have a community of people who exchange ideas and then somehow hopefully make something out of it or not. Um, and the interesting thing is that the most successful of these innovation communities are usually combining on and offline. Um, so what they do is they say, well, look, uh, we would usually meet uh, TED. When you look at TED, it started in Monterey. It was a conference, people meeting offline. And then at some point they said, well, if we put that online now as well, and um, we can see who is where and what. We can, whenever we travel, we can see where we can meet them. And we can online kind of continue the conversations we started offline and so on. Um, so I, I, I deeply believe that what a lot of organizations do completely wrong is that they think that technology is a solution in the sense of that, okay, we, we, we build up this group now mm. and then everyone will come and everyone will somehow give ideas in this group. No, I mean, it's, it's like a coffee house in, in, in Austria in the, in the 19th century. And all you say, you have people who got, come somewhere because there are interesting people, there are interesting ideas. If that's online or offline, it shouldn't matter in the end. Mm. And I think, so, so I think it's really the complementarity between the two. And if that's well managed, I think it rather enhances the ideas than, than curbing them down. Uh, but if it's not managed well, then I uh, completely agree. Then you're spending your time with Warcraft uh, multiplayer games. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah. Um, on the issue of uh, the relationship between entrepreneurship and well-being, and, and this idea of, of resilience as well, I wonder if any of the panelists would like to uh, speak to that. Only if uh, others are not speaking. Uh, why, Luke, why don't you jump uh, in? Well, I think that it's been my observation that grit is possibly the single most important ingredient in terms of entrepreneurial success. Persistence, willpower, self-discipline. I think it matters far more than IQ. I think it matters far more than background or qualifications. Uh, and I think that you know, where it comes from and whether... Um, if you've had a you know, deprived background, for example, or you lack resources, that delivers more grit, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think it's quite that simple. Uh, but there's no doubt that s some people have a hunger and a fire in their belly that I think makes the difference between success and failure. And without that, then I think you're extremely unlikely to succeed as an entrepreneur. Mm. I, I think um, entrepreneurship, if somebody can handle it, it gives greater fulfillment because he's trying, he's achieving what you try to achieve. And I also think it can improve ethics in a society at large because, after all, I can go for a job. Let's say I'm trying to take a job from Nathan, and I say, Nathan says, will you do this prosperity index? I say, sure, I need, a, I need a job. So I'll say, of course, I want to do that. Okay. So I am actually lying a little bit. Okay. So, but on the other hand, if I try to be an entrepreneurial thing, frankly, I have to do what I really want to do in some ways. So I think it, it creates a greater fidelity between what you are and what you can be, or mm. things like that. Mm. As opposed to there are a lot of people who are compromised in a job, they are not necessarily matching what they want to be and what they are. Mm. So I think, I think it has a, and I know there, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in Zambia and elsewhere who had no choice. They are not, the kind of non-choice entrepreneurs because they didn't get jobs. So that kind of entrepreneurship existed in the world when there was no, no, nobody has employed people yet. Mm. Then everybody was an entrepreneur. But what we want to see is the entrepreneur who creates a new way of looking at the economic resources. So if I'm a paddy farmer, uh, let's say rice farmer in a village, I use uh, three acres of land and grow rice and I'm happy and all that. And suddenly I realize, ah, I can use this land and grow shrimp over there. And instead of making $5,000, I make $20,000. Well, that's an entrepreneur. He is reapplied redeployed resources in a new way, okay, mm. and created greater value for himself and for society. I think that's what happens, is that then he moves forward, everybody else moves forward a bit. Mm. Okay. And I think, I think that's why it can give rise to greater fulfillment and um, greater fidelity to who you are and uh, what you can be. Mm. But it takes a little bit more 
effort and you lose sleep, you lose hair, but you, you get somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have about 10 minutes left and I want to take a few more questions from the floor um, before we start. So uh, the lady at the back was first with her hand up. Um, Deborah Sport from the University of Sheffield. Um, I think thus far all the conversations tend to focus on the economic benefits of enterprise and entrepreneurship in terms of job creation, wealth, um, and a little bit on personal development and, and human capital. Um, and I wonder if, if the panel could comment a little bit on, on some of these other indicators of prosperity and how ent enterprise and entrepreneurship and technology can actually stimulate developments in health and stimulate developments in education. Um, because I know some of the countries I work in, for example, Kenya, you have amazing, you have um, a high-speed broadband running through the country, but people with no electricity and no clinics. You have an, a, an online banking system, which we don't have in the UK, you know, an M-Pesa system, where people don't even have to go to a bank. Everyone has access to money, but they can't access clinics and they can't actually go to school. And I wonder if, um, I don't know what the answer is, and it's kind of a circular question, whether the panel could actually comment on that. Mm. Let's take one other question as well, and then Andy, please. Thank you. Um, Andrew Zeppa from Gallup. So earlier we heard about selectivity in terms of governments investing in individuals and organisations in order to develop on, uh, enterprises. Um, so this raises the question, should they be investing in the individual or the company in investing in the big idea. And if it's the individual, should they actually be actively selecting entrepreneurs on a, say, a countrywide basis to tap into those people who, who do have this pure play entrepreneurship potential? Mm. Thank you. I wonder on the first question, if I can go to Luke first, you mentioned in your opening remarks that you started to do some work on uh, kind of cures for cancer and, and innovation around that. And the first question was about moving away from the economic benefits of entrepreneurship and how actually we can find benefits in health, for example, and education and elsewhere. Well, there's the obvious benefit that uh, in a capitalist society, if you get uh, economic success, you get higher tax revenues, which helps pay for public services. Um, and, you know, you tend to get, with more serious business, you tend to get better governance, which means less corruption, higher tax collection, and that again helps fund public services. Also, when it comes to health outcomes, you know, a very obvious indicator of ill health is unemployment. You know, you give people a job, they tend to be healthier. Um, I mean, clearly there are lots of innovations that can be um, applied from the private sector into the public sector, and the public sector itself can itself be innovative too. I think without the financial motivation, motivations, it tends to be less predictable. Um, I also think that when it comes to things like fundamental research, actually the subsidy that government frequently gives and plays is pretty important. And without the very fundamental basic research, the um, adapted innovations that is what you know, drives commercial technology can't arise. So you, know, you need the combination of both for um, a, a successful and happy society. Mm. Um, and on the second point, um, looking at whether uh, we should be looking to invest in an individual or in the big idea um, uh, that sort of uh, that, that individual might be uh, putting forward. Um, in terms of investment, I wonder if, Christian, you might kind of kick us off. Uh, where should the sort of the focus be? Should it be on, on the person themselves or should it be on their, their big idea? I think it's a brilliant question. Um, so uh, what we tried over six years actually is trying to understand when you have an exciting innovator in design or an author mm -hmm. or so a person who doesn't have an investable asset in a way but rather I mean the person itself produces a book at some point but you can't really it's hard to invest into a book in the kind of more uh, VC type way you would invest into a state tech startup. So I guess um, one of the key challenges of, a, of to, to understand there was kind of this, this, this um, how would you call it, not dichotomy, but this idea that on the one hand side you would prefer to invest into the individual because that is the person who at 20 does an exciting project but at 25 does an even more exciting project and with 30 does the real big project. Mm. And so that's when you look at, at organizations like innovation communities, that's the idea of that, right? That you say 
you, you take them along a journey and you say, you know that along this journey they will have several investable projects, so you do both. You somehow try to build the ecosystem around this person to say, okay, we go with you on the journey, and then whenever a project pumps up, you already know this person, mm. and you already then can, can invest into this. So um, I think it's still, when you try to learn, I mean, in Switzerland, for example, they had these examples where they invested into students. So they said students who couldn't afford to pay university fees um, they could then try to find a sponsor who would invest into them and then at some point they would pay back once they have an income that allows them to pay back and all these different models that, that emerge around this. And I feel um, this again has this very unidimensional view on it in terms of its capital and then you give the capital and then somehow the person makes something out of it. Mm. But if you create a community around it or if you try to understand how an emotional support system that as an additional uh, benefit then provides capital. I think that's where the real power lies. So when I think from a governmental perspective or from, from, a, from a kind of regional innovation center perspective, I think it would be a lot about creating these innovation um, communities that allow not only to have a person at a certain point in time at the transaction mm. um, where you say, okay, I go to a VC and now I pitch to this person and then I have a referral or I don't have a referral, but rather a person who grows up with others who then can vouch for this within an ecosystem, gets the emotional support, gets the investment of all the other pieces as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say it's, it's kind of like a complementarity between the two to say, bring them along the journey and then invest at different points in time. Yes, okay, thank you. I want to give final comments first to <laughs> Professor Ortio and then to uh, Iqbal. Um, just on the, um, uh, on the first question of those two, uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the benefits um, that go beyond the uh, economic uh, in terms of entrepreneurship, um, how do you see, uh, and, do you, and you know, are there any sort of particular examples that come to mind of how entrepreneurship not only produces economic benefits but also uh, kind of wider benefits as well? Well, that's a very difficult question because you can look at it at so many levels. First, there's, there's conflicting evidence. You know, if you look at, if you talk about well-being and if you talk about well-being of entrepreneurs, there's exactly two kinds of evidence out there. One set of evidence states that the well-being of entrepreneurs is higher because they are their own bosses and uh, they can do whatever they want to. And, and there's another set of evidence that suggests that because you are your own boss, you can never take a vacation. And, and besides, in a small business, you know, all the support structures that large corporations can provide you, you, you know, including a health policy, do not necessarily exist. And, and there's actually some evidence from Denmark where they record everything. And, and they were able to link um, employment status, self-employment, and, and the use of prescription drugs, and they found a positive correlation there. So I don't know at that level what the outcome is. Certainly at the, more, at the higher level, at the societal level, well, two things. Um, um, we, we find, uh, and, and this goes, excuse me, but it actually goes back to economic benefits. There is a positive correlation between the quality of the entrepreneurial dynamic within the economy mm -hmm. and total factor productivity in the country. When you put in um, the quality of entrepreneurship and its multi composite thing and into an equation that productivity economists use to predict total factor productivity, which is the ultimate driver of economic growth, you see a positive uh, <coughs> leading effect with a two-year time lag, as you would expect, <coughs> because entrepreneurship is a trial and error process, mm. and it's a resource allocation dynamic. So if you find a good opportunity, resources get stuck to a high productivity use. If the opportunity turns out not to be viable, then the resources are released to alternative uses. So you actually get an effect on productivity. But perhaps more widely, what entrepreneurship does to you, and this is goes, goes to the context of, of low-income economies, and if you think about the Arab Spring, for example, mm. in those kinds of countries, it can have a huge liberating effect because it affects income distribution, makes it less cute, less, less biased, and it, it tends to have a general democratizing effect on the on the country mm. in low-income contexts. In more advanced societies, what you tend to see, especially during recent years, is some kind of a dynamic where 
innovation itself becomes socially driven. And, and you mentioned all these user communities discovering new ways of doing things. And, and this is an area where entrepreneurs actually do a lot at the moment, engaging the user in innovation and, and harnessing various online devices to engage the public <coughs> in the production of social innovation. A mm. lot of innovation nowadays is not technology driven, it's business model innovation mm -hmm. and new ways of organizing mm. and doing things. And this is clearly an area where entrepreneurs have a big role to play. Okay, thank you. Very, very finally, Iqbal, um, mm. in 45 seconds, yeah. um, I wonder if you could leave us with um, a, a real life example. I mean, you have uh, all these fellows with, at, at the center at MIT yeah. um, who come in, learn entrepreneur, real skills and then go out and, and kind of put it to good use. Um, mm. I wonder if you can leave us with an example um, of uh, where, where entrepreneurship has produced benefits other than economic uh, returns, so the kind of the social impact. If there's a specific example that comes to mind uh, when you think about well, that. We have a, In 45 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> we have a student who um, has created a, is starting to create a chain of uh, diabetic clinics in Mexico mm. where it's a um, it's a commercial venture. He's on to his third clinic right now. But it allows low-income people manage their diabetes as a disease mm. um, um, a, a, with a low cost. And um, so it's like a McDonald of, of management of diabetes as a disease. Wow. And so it can be a commercial venture, but it certainly is improving people's lives. Mm. Okay. Uh, and there are many examples like that. 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sorry to cut.